Welcome to a Paul Life Sciences and Microfluidics webinar entitled Production and Sterilization of Biopharmaceutical Nanoemulsions Using Filtration. Microfluidics and Paul collaborate to develop a filtration-based alternative to terminal heat sterilization for a squalene nanoemulsion. My name is Kyle Jandrositz. I work for Microfluidics International Corporation as an Applications Research Engineer. I will be explaining the microfluidics portion of the webinar as well as serving as today's moderator. During today's webinar, participants will learn about the production of the squalene nanoemulsion. With this, you will learn about the microfluidics technology and the benefit of the microfluidization process, as well as how to produce the squalene nanoemulsion with the microfluidizer. Participants will also learn about the sterile filtration process of the squalene nanoemulsion. During this discussion, we will talk about filtration in a pharmaceutical process, key particle removal mechanisms, and how to sterile filter the squalene nanoemulsion that is created with the microfluidizer. Nanoemulsions are often used as a drug delivery vehicle. Two of the primary benefits of this are to protect the patient from adverse side effects and to protect the actual drug from premature breakdown. The microfluidizer is an excellent technology for creating nanoencapsulations, such as nanoemulsions, for drug delivery. Terminal sterilization with heat is often not an option for these nanoemulsions, so sterile filtration is employed. Validation of sterile filtration with formulations such as these nanoemulsions can require increasingly robust technical solutions. During this webinar, we will demonstrate the production and successful sterile filtration of our nanoemulsion-based drug delivery system. I'm going to start off today by giving an introduction of the microfluidics technology and talk about the production of the squalene nanoemulsion using the microfluidizer. I will then pass it off to members of the Paul team to give an introduction of the pharmaceutical filtration process as well as talk about the sterile filtration of our squalene nanoemulsion. We will wrap today up with some question and answers. As mentioned before, my name is Kyle Jandrositz, and I work for Microfluidics as an Applications Research Engineer. I specialize in proof-of-concept tests, process development with microfluidics processing technology, and data analysis. Joining me today from Paul Life Sciences is Ross Trammell, a Senior Technical Specialist in the Scientific and Laboratory Services Division of Paul. Ross specializes in aseptic bulk drug delivery processing design and the incorporation and use of all types of filtration. Also joining me from Paul Life Sciences is Dr. Martha Falmsby, a principal scientist in the Scientific and Laboratory Services Division of Paul. Martha specializes in bacterial and bacteriophage retention testing of sterilizing grade filters. Microfluidics has been in business for over 30 years. We have thousands of customers that are worldwide. The microfluidizer produces nanomaterials for many different applications, primarily the pharmaceutical industry. Several of these drugs are currently on the market and have been approved for delivery. What does microfluidics do best? We create nanoemulsions. We perform cell disruption for biotechnology with a very high protein recovery. We are very efficient at particle size reduction and nanoencapsulation. This technology is also used for nanodispersions and for deagglomeration applications. At the bottom of the screen, you can see several different types of our microfluidizer technology, as well as the core technology of every microfluidizer, the fixed geometry interaction chamber. This is a schematic of our microfluidizer processor. On the left, you can see the inlet reservoir, which allows for continuous processing. It has the ability to accommodate materials with high solid content, and high viscosities, as well as a wide range of temperatures. One of the key characteristics of the microfluidizer processor is the content pressure intensifier pump. This is important because it delivers all of the material at a very uniform pressure profile to the interaction chamber. Lastly is our interaction chamber, which is the heart of our microfluidizer processor. As mentioned before, it is a fixed geometry microchannel which ensures that all of your material is being processed at a very consistent shear rate. 
These are a couple cartoons of the two different styles of interaction chambers that are available. The one on the left is a Y-type interaction chamber. This is ideal for processing emulsions and liquid-only formulations. The one on the right is a Z-type interaction chamber. This is ideal for formulations that contain solids. Both of these styles are made out of very wear-resistant materials such as polycrystalline diamond. They have the ability to be cleaned in place and steamed in place. And they come in a variety of different sizes as well as the two shapes that we just discussed. The main benefit of the microfluidizer processor is the extremely high shear rate that we are able to generate, which is much greater than other technologies. as well as the inherent scalability of our processor. When we scale, we add additional microchannels that are placed in parallel to ensure that every microliter receives the same processing conditions. Also, this ensures that the processing conditions used at the lab scale are able to be replicated at the production scale with near identical results. This is a summary of what I have discussed so far. Some of the key features and benefits of our technology are as followed. The microfluidizer processor offers constant pressure processing with a very high processing potential, up to 30,000 PSI. Our core technology is the fixed geometry interaction chamber. And multi-slotted interaction chambers are available for scaling up. These features result in a very small particle size potential. Consistent processing results in very narrow particle size distribution. And we guarantee scaling up from the lab scale to the production scale with the microfluidizer. Our collaboration with Paul began by choosing a robust formulation that is commonly found in industry. We chose a squalene nanoemulsion that represents a popular vaccine adjuvant. This formulation is made up of a water phase and an oil phase, each containing a surfactant. A premix was created by combining both of these phases and mixing them with a rotor stator. This premix was then processed on the M110P microfluidizer processor through the F12Y H30Z interaction chamber configuration. The processing pressure and number of passes were varied, providing different particle size distributions. At this stage, the goal was to create a distribution that both effectively passed through the sterile filter and was reproducible. Here are the results achieved with the microfluidizer processor at varying pressures and number of passes. It is important to take note not only how tight the distributions are, but also how small the D95 particles are because these are the particles that will prevent material from passing through the sterile filter. After the initial filterability tests were completed, test E was selected for the bacteria challenge test. For these tests, sample E was repeated over 20 times, achieving near identical results with a standard deviation of around five nanometers. If anyone has any questions further about the microfluidics technology, please use this contact information on this slide to reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Our next speaker is Ross Trammell, a Senior Technical Specialist at the Scientific and Laboratory Services Division of Paul. Ross will discuss the process of sterile filtering our squalene nanoemulsion. Thank you, Kyle, for that introduction. As Kyle mentioned, my name is Ross Trammell. I've been very excited to lead a team uh, within Paul in the United States that has been tasked with finding a strategy that allows for the sterile filtration of oil and water emulsion and liposomal solutions. This webinar is a direct result of the first half of that work with emulsion, done by a team of Paul and microfluidics scientists and engineers working in partnership. Paul has many clients that produce emulsion and liposomal products. One common theme with this class of products is that they can fall into what we at Paul term high-risk fluids. A high-risk fluid is any fluid where a strong potential exists of a bacterial retention failure event occurring during a sterile filtration validation. With these high-risk fluids, Paul has noted additional issues with low throughput, meaning low or variable volumes through a filter and low recovery of oil phase has also been a strong pattern with this class of product. First, we should discuss contamination. When I think about contamination, I think about control. Contamination, when found in processing, is a result in the loss of control. If we require a consistent result, 
for instance, the consistent production of a product free of contaminant, we must have control over our raw materials, processed fluids, and the environment the product is produced in. With high-risk fluids, we must have a strategy that consistently removes the contaminants regardless of source. As this slide shows, contaminants can come from external sources like processed fluids, raw materials, and personnel. Contaminants can come from the wear of components like pumps or valves, or even bacterial growth within the equipment. Bacterium can alter the products produced and interfere with consistent production from batch to batch and must be mitigated. Additionally, maintenance and cleaning with anything that can shed particulate like a towel should not be used prior to processing. Cleanliness is a key component of our strategy. First, the microfluidizer and processing pathways like tubing and hold vessels must be clean and contaminant free. In our early work with the squalene nanoemulsion, we learned that even a cleaned laboratory microfluidizer can generate a solution with a bacterial load if that cleaning is not robust and filtration directly out of the unit was not employed. A key concept we should all understand, emulsion and especially nutrient-rich emulsion solutions require pre-filtration directly out of microfluidizers. We learned that Supor EKV as a pre-filter reduced bacterial contamination and allowed for consistency in the bacterial retention studies that followed. What is Supor EKV? Supor EKV is a double layer polyether sulfone membrane. The upstream layer is asymmetric with a narrowing pore structure as the fluid passes through the membrane. The downstream layer is symmetric with a consistent 0.2 micron rated pore structure through the membrane. Supor EKV is a fully validated sterilizing grade filter with a broad pH compatibility. However, with these high-risk fluids, Supor EKV should be employed as a pre-filter to another filter that we found to have high throughput and recovery with full retention of bacterium. That filter is fluoridine EXEDF. I'll be discussing fluoridine EXEDF at the end of my presentation. What does Supor EKV remove? Well, it'll remove contaminants and provide control. This allows for a consistent feed stream for fluoridine EXEDF. I have some relative sizes of small contaminants on this screen. Removing contaminants with a pre-filter is a critical step to ensure the consistency of filtration result. What I'd like to highlight and what you should note is that the bacteria shown on this screen is at a size of 0.3 micron or 300 nanometers. We should think of size range in nanometers when we talk about anything microfluidized, and you'll see why I'm pointing this out in a slide further on. There are three removal mechanisms that work to get particles to interact with the filter matrix. The first is through direct interception. Direct interception is the removal of a contaminant or particle via physical size. If contaminants or particles are too large to pass through the filtration matrix, they are retained in or on the matrix. The second removal mechanism is through diffusional interception. Diffusional interception is the removal of a contaminant or particle due to random motion as that particle passes through a filter matrix. The concept of diffusional interception is primarily used to describe the filtration retention mechanism of gas filters when used to filter gas. The third removal mechanism is through inertial impaction. During filtration, contaminants or particles in a fluid can repeatedly change direction to follow the torturous pathways found in a filter matrix. As the fluid changes direction, inertial forces can cause particles or contaminants to impact on the filtration medium and be retained even though the particles and contaminants could be smaller than the rating of the filter membrane. Now there are two retention mechanisms that hold particles or contaminants in a filter matrix, even though liquid or gas is flowing through that matrix, creating a drag force on the particle or contaminant held in the matrix. These are termed mechanical retention and adsorption. Mechanical retention occurs due to the relative size of particles or contaminants being greater than that of the filter matrix pore size. As these larger particles and contaminants pass into the filtration matrix, they are retained in the smaller maze-like structure of the filter material. 
Adsorption can occur due to electrochemical charge differentials between the filtration matrix and the contaminants or particles in a fluid stream. The contaminants or particles can attach to and be retained in the matrix. It should be noted that the two filters used in our study do not carry a charge claim, and adsorption via charge was not part of the study. Here we have a surface view of a filter matrix. What should be noted here is that many of the pore sizes at the surface of the membrane are greater than 0.2 micron. This membrane carries a 0.2 micron rating and, as we can see, has retained a challenge or organism, Brevundimonas diminuta. Brevundimonas diminuta is used as a standard challenge organism by Paul Corporation to demonstrate bacterial retention. Martha Folmsby will discuss this in detail in the following section. This picture is, is of a membrane cutaway under bacterial challenge. Brevundimonas diminuta bacterium is shown retained both on the membrane surface and within the matrix. Additionally, one can see that the Brevundimonas bacterium have penetrated into the membrane at a depth of 10 micron. It should be noted that a typical membrane thickness is roughly 40 to 150 micron. The thickness of the membranes, along with using a multi-layered approach, is critical to bacterial retention, especially with a high-risk fluid. Here I've created a large-scale processing model. This model may not represent your process, but I use this to provide a pictorial representation of what can be possible now that we have a consistent strategy. At the left of the slide, both aqueous and oil phase are mixed together in a premix step. Here I'm using a single-use mixer with a direct bottom-mounted drive, our Paul Allegro mixer, to mix the phases together prior to microfluidization. Note that I've placed a representation of Supor EKV directly after the microfluidizer and prior to fluoridine EXEDF. Fluoridine EXEDF provides the sterilizing grade filtration, leading to a sterile hold step. I've depicted the use of a sterile hold bag in tote with sterilizing grade air filter used for gas exchange during the hold. Note that I've also included the use of additional aqueous phase as a final formulation buffer if required. What I'd like to highlight is that any additional filtration required after prefiltration with Supor EKV should be performed with fluoridine EX EDF. Now, with our process model in mind, perhaps the most important early discovery made during the study was that the use of a microfluidizer allowed for the generation of a controlled mean particle size with a sharp Gaussian curve for size range and SUPOR EKV was superior for flux and throughput at a D50 of 124 nanometers. Here I've given some bench scale throughput values using 30 PSI differential during filtration. As you can see, a D50 of 124 nanometers yields the highest results shown. We demonstrated through our tests that in general, a higher mean particle size beyond 124 nanometers corresponds to lower throughput through Supor EKV. We can see the stark contrast in filtration success from 124 nanometers to 155 nanometers. For instance, if we look at the volumes possible through Supor EKV in small 220 centimeter squared capsule format, we see that the bench scale test implies that we could obtain 28 liters of an emulsion solution through that small filter. If we use the same 220 centimeter squared capsule with a D50 of around 155 nanometers, we can only take away 1.6 liters of filtered uh, emulsion. An additional discovery made during the tests with Supor EKV demonstrated that size range corresponded to flux seen during filtration. As we can see again, a D50 of 124 nanometers yields the highest flux shown. As Martha will discuss fluoridine EX EDF in her presentation, I should speak to what fluoridine EX EDF is. Fluoridine EX EDF is a hybrid serial layer filter that utilizes an upstream asymmetric polyether sulfone membrane over a downstream symmetric PVDF layer. The upstream PES layer is asymmetric with a narrowing pore structure as fluids pass through the membrane. The downstream PVDF layer is symmetric with a consistent 0.2 micron rated pore structure throughout the membrane. 
Fluoridine EX EDF is a fully validated sterilizing grade filter and should be employed as the final filter for high risk emulsion solutions. Finally, an additional throughput and flux study was performed with Supor EKV placed directly over Fluoridine EX EDF. At a filtration pressure of 30 psid, Fluoridine EX EDF placed behind EKV generated a throughput of greater than 1,000 liters per meter squared at an average flux of 4,300 liters per meter squared. Now note this final test was done at a D50 of 120 nanometers, but having such high numbers shows that we have a very strong economic model with this filter. So I thank you for your attention. Thanks for that presentation, Ralph. Our next speaker is Dr. Martha Falmsby, a principal scientist at the Scientific and Laboratory Services Division of Paul. Martha will discuss the bacteria challenge test. Thank you for that introduction. So far, you've heard about making an emulsion, the available technology, and the benefits of the microfluidization process. You've also learned a little about filtration in a pharmaceutical process, some key particle removal mechanisms, and fluid flux. And now I'd like to talk about sterile filtration, that final step. And as many as of you may already be aware, industry standards require sterilizing grade filters be challenged with Brevundimonas diminuta at a minimum concentration of 10 to the 7th CFU per centimeter squared, and the filter must provide a completely sterile effluent. So there are two stages to establishing this level of filter performance. First, it's rated as a sterilizing grade filter by the manufacturer, which includes stringent quality controls to ensure that each filter meets that specification. And since the rating test is of four filters, a bacterial challenge test, which is a destructive test, that means that we also need a non-destructive test to be able to test each filter prior to release. And this is why the bacterial retention rating test is also correlated to a non-destructive test called an integrity test. Each sterilizing grade filter is then tested using that associated integrity test prior to release. And the second stage of establishing a sterilizing grade filter performance is that of a process-specific test, where the filter is tested under the conditions of actual use with actual product when possible. This is a filter validation or a filter qualification test. The integrity test, like a forward flow or bubble point, is performed on the individual filter at the time of view. So both sterilizing filter rating tests and most of the process-specific tests are usually performed with Provandimonas diminuta, and this is as specified in the ASTM standard, so it's an industry standard, not just something we do here at Paul. It's the standard test method for determining bacterial retention ratings of membrane filters utilizing liquid filtration. So B. diminuta is the bacteria used, often called B. dim. Provandimonas diminuta is a very small gram-negative modal bacteria. It was chosen as a reference test organism due to its ubiquity, its small size, and the ease of culture. And it's an important, of course, to use a test organism that is small, but it's also important to use one that's easily cultured so you can be sure you can detect it if it does get through the filter. And this is a comparison size slide for just showing how it compares relative some, to some common pathogens. The filter efficiencies are evaluated using a bacterial challenge test Suspensions of test bacteria are pumped or pushed through a test filter, immediately followed by passage through a secondary analysis filter, which serves to capture any bacteria that managed to pass through the test filter. The analysis filter is then directly painted on culture media. In this way, the entire effluent is analyzed for the presence of bacteria, and the passage of even a single bacteria, which is measured as colony-forming units, would be an indicate a failure of that bacterial challenge test. So for obvious and very necessary reasons, it's a very stringent test. Here's a cartoon diagram of a simple bacterial challenge test showing the vessel containing the bacterial suspension, the test filter, and then the analysis filter. This picture shows an example of bacterial colonies on an analysis disk post-filtration, post-incubation. So it would show if any bacteria got through, they would grow on that analysis disk. As you can see, this is a performance-based test, and that's why it's also important to evaluate your performance under your conditions of actual use. For a filter rating test, the bacteria would generally be suspended in a buffer or some similar fluid, and then for the process-specific test, the bacteria would be suspended in the process fluid. So there are two possible outcomes to a bacterial challenge test, either absolute retention or some degree of retention, which is a measure of filter efficiency when talking about bacterial retention. So filter efficiency is expressed as titer reduction. It is a ratio of the total number of bacteria 
in the effluent, which are coming out of the back of the filter, divided by the total number of bacteria in the influent. This can be expressed also as the log reduction value, sometimes referred to as the LRV. For sterilizing grade filters, the downstream bacterial count must be zero, meaning that no bacteria are detected on the analysis filter. And in that case, the tetra reduction then would be described as equal to the total number of influent bacteria, equal to or greater than. In a process-specific bacterial retention testing, the filter is tested under a scaled-down version of actual process conditions. It includes three test filters, so testing a triplicate, from three different manufacturing lots, and yet usually must include a minimum specification membrane, so you're covering the, the entire expanse of uh, manufacturing quality. A 0.45 micron rated penetration control filter is also tested at the same time, and this documents the penetrative ability of the test organism. A minimum challenge of 10 to the 7 percent of colony forming units per centimeter squared is applied, and that entire effluent then, as I mentioned, is passed through a recovery filter. So as we've been talking about, and as Ross mentioned, the high-risk fluids, one thing I'd like to point out, though, and almost always, in most process-specific filter validation, complete retention is actually documented. There's just these rare few cases where penetration is detected, which led us to start looking more closely at these particular fluids. And when we examined those instances where there was failure, we found that these penetration events are predominantly a result of filtration of your emulsions, of liposomes, or other lipid-containing fluids. So in those specific cases, that's where it's important to address this risk early in process development to help ensure your successful eventual filter validation. So on the testing that we did here for the early screen, for these tests, we used a super EKV, which was the pre-filtration, followed by a fluorodynex EDF filter. Now, the test that I described, the bacterial challenge test, and the, and the amount it was challenged with refers to just the EDF challenge. We used the 5% squalene emulsion produced by microfluidics, as previously described, and we tested at three differential pressures, 60, 30, and 10 PSID. And then the particle size distribution was also evaluated at two of those pressures, at 30 and at 60. So this table shows the results of the challenges at 60 PSID. You can see it gives the flux, the total bacteria that were applied to the filter, the test filter, and then the challenge level. So we met that 10 to the 7 per centimeter squared, and no penetration was detected. So the analysis filters were clean. And when we tried that also at 30 PSID, we get the similar results. We have zero penetration, just slightly reduced flux. And at 10 PSID, again, no penetration, and, but your flux, of course, is going down with a decreasing pressure. So this graph shows the particle size and distribution of the nanoemulsion particles themselves, because it's important that we get a sterile product, but we also want to make sure we leave that drug intact. The light blue column shows the particle size distribution pre-filtration, and then the others show the particle size distribution post-filtration. So there was no detectable change. That means we didn't lose the drug delivery system to the filter. So in summary, we have shown you an example of an early screen of a representative drug delivery vehicle using a single pass small volume challenge. And all the filters showed complete retention at 60, 30, and 10 PSID. And there was no change in emulsion particle size distribution. And this early screen is a critical step, particularly in the development of a nano emulsion drug delivery formulation and the evaluation of the proposed manufacturing process prior to finalization of that process. It could be very helpful when eventually moving towards successful validation of the final manufacturing process. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that presentation, Martha. To summarize the entire webinar, the microfluidizer can produce nanomaterials for a wide variety of applications. Due to the nature of many nanoemulsion drug delivery systems, sterile filtration is often required. The validation of the sterile filtration with a nanoemulsion can require increasingly robust technical solutions. The successful sterile filtration of a nanoemulsion-based drug is by utilizing a pre-filter step with Supor EKV followed by a fluoridine EX EDF filter. This provides an example of the benefits of early screening to provide a technical solution for complex applications. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. We look forward to engaging in the future webinars as we introduce new capabilities from Paul Life Sciences and the Microfluidics International Corporation.